What's up everybody, Thrall's Metal here once again. I'm the Croc Neck and I am back with some more Estates of Metal. And this time we are venturing up north and east and we are going to go over some New Hampshire metal. Why New Hampshire? It's the Granite State and that means it rocks. And that's a terrible joke to open with, but that's what I'm sticking with. Anyway, let's go into what I know about New Hampshire. It is the fifth smallest state by area and the 10th least populous state in the United States. So it's like in the top 10 states if you don't want to run into people that much. The state's motto, live free or die, is probably either a bumper sticker on the car of or tattooed on the body of pretty much every libertarian in the state, which that state is quite the hub for those guys. And girls too, but well, mostly I just kind of run into dudes that call themselves libertarians because yeah, we, we got them here too. The state was called North Virginia for a little while, which was confusing since we already have a regular Virginia and a West Virginia. And I feel like we need a South and an East Virginia kind of like complement all those. You know, I don't know if we keep the regular Virginia as just Virginia or like Central Virginia. Naming states is difficult and Virginia was a pretty popular name, I guess. During the Civil War, over 10% of the population of that state was enlisted. I think it had the highest percentage of enlisted troops uh, in the Civil War in terms of the states, or at least in the northern states. I don't know about the southern states, but I mean, that's a lot of people. And again, it's not a super populous state. Another fun thing I found out was technically Uncle Sam was born in New Hampshire. Now I say technically because the gentleman they named this character after, Samuel Wilson, was actually from Massachusetts, but he worked in a meatpacking facility and he would stamp everything U.S. Now this was during the War of 1812, which I mean, I imagine the troops were looking for a symbol, something to rally behind, and they kind of created this figure, Uncle Sam, out of it, and he was essentially the guy they modeled him after, because, I mean, I assume he probably kind of at least looked like him. I don't know, I thought that was kind of interesting. Like, I thought it was like a completely made-up character forever. I didn't know he was actually based on a real person. However, a real person that was born there and was pretty famous for horrible reasons was H.H. H. Holmes. Mr. Murder Mansion is a New Hampshire, or New Hampshire, -er? I don't know what they call themselves there. Anyway, yeah, he's from there and I swear, low key, he's probably inspired more and more haunted attractions around Halloween to be more grisly and more just intense, like to the point where you have to look and see if you have to sign a waiver to get in. Like, I feel like one day we're just gonna get a flat out murder mansion and people are just gonna sign like, oh wait, I die? Cool, all right, that's fine. The first potatoes ever grown in the United States were grown in New Hampshire, and that is in no way, shape, or form a joke about libertarians. Sorry, I have to make fun of them because I know some and Man, uh, if you get locked in a conversation with them, you better have a couple of IPAs on hand to distract them. And of course, I had to look into some weird laws because every state has weird laws, and honestly, I wish I'd been doing this since the start. But uh, one that jumped out at me that I thought was really interesting was that it is illegal to employ the aid of a ferret while hunting in New Hampshire. Now, a lot of different images kind of went through my head when I read that one, like, you know, maybe it's just for a small game, like they're hunting squirrels, and like to just send a ferret out to kill them, and like, good boy, cool, I'll take that. But me being me, I thought of like a gentleman in furs wearing a bandolier of ferrets, and they're all kind of like strapped in, and he just kind of throws them like a grenade at a deer, and they gnaw on their neck or something like that. It's in no way that cool or weird, I know that, but that's just how my brain operates. I also read that there was an old law that it was illegal to keep time with music while you are in a bar or a tavern. So you can't just like nod your head or tap your foot or tap your finger on the table to the rhythm of the music like you had to find like an off time pattern, which is difficult because if you've been drinking, like you hear your song come on yeah, it's, it's kind of natural. It's like, yeah, that's my jam. I mean, even before jukeboxes, if there was like someone playing something in a tavern, like, oh, I like that song. I'm going to move my body rhythmically to it because that's what you do as a human being when you like something that's musical. Well, not in New Hampshire. Fuck you, hold still. And by far one of the most interesting ones I found was that the pores on sugar containers uh, for like coffee and such can be no wider than three eighths of an inch wide. So that just tells me there was someone out there that had to measure them just to make sure they fell within parameters. My God, what a lame job that must have been. But anyway, the state actually does have some pretty killer metal bands. And this is one where it's not just like one particular sound, like this is just 
kind of all the metal bands that I have from New Hampshire. And honestly, they're all kind of different. There's definitely some ties to the hardcore scene that came out of Massachusetts since, you know, they're kind of neighbors. And there's even one band in particular that did start in New Hampshire and then move to, you know, Massachusetts. But I still count it because at least their origins are there and I already covered Massachusetts. And I really wanted to talk about this band in particular. But yeah, I got an interesting batch of bands here. So let's get into them. Scissor Fight, Jaggernaut. This is the sixth album from this Portsmouth stoner sludge, quote unquote, acid mountain rock act. I have been a fan of this band since their album, New Hampshire. Isn't that wild? Someone gave me that album years ago and I ended up liking it. And then I heard another one of their songs simply called Blizzards, Buzzards, Bastards. And I was just instantly hooked with how strange this band is. And this band is odd, right down to the name. The name is definitely not about like two people actually fighting with scissors. It's the other kind where like, it looks like two ladies are wrestling and if they're doing it right, they'll both win. It's that kind of scissor fight. But musically, I would say like a lot of this stuff is very similar to like Clutch or Melvin's. It's kind of a blend of the two because while it's got like the big clutch rock hooks on it, like they're heavy, they're sludgy, it definitely has like a lot of the early clutch sound, like Transnational Speedway in there. It has that sort of odd flair that Melvin's has, like stuff coming out of nowhere. Songs like Appalachian Chain are kind of driven more by banjos than they are the heavy riffs. There's a really cool harmonica solo on 86 Sucker, but at the same time, there's also some really heavy, just sludgier than hell riffs. The opening track, Dynamite, just stomps right in with this massive, disgusting riff. Fang is a heavy, but kind of haunting song with one repeated refrain. The echoes of my voice causes avalanches, and then it's just a lot of like cool atmospheric guitars, and the closing riff on that song is just catchier than hell. And then you have Backwoods, which is, I don't know, sort of like a mountain man anthem about drinking deer blood and hunting down Bigfoot or something like that. I'm not entirely sure what it's about, but that's kind of like par for the course of this band because the lyrics are even stranger than the music. Now this was their last album for a while. They broke up after this and then reformed with a different singer. But the singer on this one, who went by the name Iron Lung, was <laughs> pretty interesting. He would kind of move around from like gruff singing and kind of crooning to these kind of grown vocals to spoken word. And man, he would say all sorts of just crazy stuff, but it was very themed around uh, the Appalachian Mountains and being in New Hampshire. This band definitely had a shtick and they stuck to it. And his vocal delivery, like, it's kind of this weird hybrid between like Neil Fallon and Billy Gibbons. Like think of Billy Gibbons doing LaGrange. Very much like that, that kind of rough throat. Like he's been smoking a pack of cools outside negative 20 degree weather, like probably on Mount Washington. But his weird vocals and the frequently shifting nature of this album going from like kind of like these lighthearted fun jams to songs that are like notably a little bit more dark and sinister. It kind of makes this album and honestly this band in general just a very interesting band to kind of dive into because all their albums are just kind of weird. It's a very meat and potatoes style when you kind of break it down. Like it's just riffs, and groove, and mostly about the tone and the weird atmosphere. But it kind of has its own unique appeal to it. Like this album and by extension, I would say most of their music is like the soundtrack to a bar fight, except everyone in the bar is also on LSD. Anyway, this is a fantastic album. This was so much fun to go back and listen to. I also recommend their album, Man Trapping for Sport and Profit. Yeah, the album titles are weird too. Uh, the song titles on that one are also wild as well. But yeah, this is a fun band. I believe they are still around. They do have a new singer now. I have not heard anything with the new singer, but I mean, if it's remotely close to this, then I'll probably dig it. But yeah, uh, just check this band out. They're just truly, delightful. And I would say they are the most New Hampshire band you'd run into, but they did move to Boston. So, uh, I guess that's up for debate now, but either way, check this out. Angel Morgue in the Morgue of Angels. This is the debut album from this Manchester death metal act. I snagged this album when I was essentially just kind of perusing the band camp of Redefining Darkness, which I do fairly often. And I saw this one, I checked out a track, it was like, dude, that is heavier than hell. And uh, I ended up buying it. This band features current and former members of bands like Cactus Hag, Hellcunt, and Shithammered. I don't know any of those bands, 
but I definitely wanted to say their names because their names are absolutely awesome. But what's also awesome is this album. This is cavernous, kind of doomy, super sinister sounding death metal, very much in the vein of Morbid Angel, Incantation. The opening track in here, Lust Murderer, is I believe over 10 minutes long and it has this great, slow, doomy buildup. The production here is just filthy sounding, but it's also huge. Like it was recorded in a much larger cavern than some other cavernous death metal acts. Tons of sinister harmonies on here and admittedly like a little bit of black metal, like the song, the sigil and the key, the tremolo riffs and the heavy strumming on that song in particular just have a more cold black metal feel. Though the vocals stay mostly kind of low and cavernous, you do get the occasional scream on there. And there is like a, added sinister vibe to it. And there are like other black metal moments on here. They're just more or less accents, but that was probably the biggest one that stood out to me that you could make an argument saying that this is, you know, maybe black and death metal as well. But I would say this definitely stays more along the lines of incantation, especially in terms of like the tempo shifts, like Holocaust perversions, both the opening and the ending of that song just have huge droning death doom riffs. The middle of the song is definitely more up-tempo, like there's a lot of groove and a fair amount of blasts on here, and it's a good a variety of like riff changes and tempo changes, but the death doom moments on here hit particularly hard. And of course, this thing is just riffier than hell. Honestly, some of the doomier sections on here when they choose to like drone on a particular chord or like, you know, kind of sustain it for a bit, some definite comparisons can be made to a band like Spectral Voice too. And even when they settle into like some mid-tempo grooves on here, there's definitely like a little bit of a doomy flair to them, especially on songs like Sacrificial War of Death and the various stages of decomposition. Pretty much if you love just flat out cavernous, evil, blasphemous sounding death metal, I'm reasonably sure you're gonna like this. Again, big vibes of incantation. I'd say like drawn and quartered is kind of comparable and definitely some Morbid Angel riffs here and there. And again, that touch of black metal kind of opens it up a little bit. But yeah, this was an absolutely awesome blind buy. Came out uh, back in 2020, so hopefully the band is working on something new because this was really good. But if this ends up being the only thing they put out, they put out one hell of an album. Definitely check this one out. Vatnet Viscar, Settler. This is the third album from this play style. Uh, it's P-L-A-I-S-T-O-W. I'm not entirely sure how to say that town's name, uh, but I think I'm kind of close. Anyway, this is atmospheric slash post black metal. And uh, this band, I believe this was the last one released under this moniker. They just became Vatinet after that. Anyway, they ended up breaking up in 2018. And then actually one of the key members of this band ended up forming Asteroid not too long after that. And Asteroid is kind of comparable to this. This is definitely more of that shoegazy, very atmospheric, you know, kind of black metal. I mean, I guess you can just call it post black metal because that's at least what they say on the archives, but it's heavy on droning tremolos and more bright ascending riffs. Like honestly, there's only a few moments in here where it feels very dark and sinister. This is more about like lush soundscapes and building a wall of sound and yeah, you could probably make some comparisons to Deaf Heaven, but to that I would say yeah, no, it's it's kind of like Deaf Heaven, but it's actually enjoyable. I'm not like the biggest Deaf Heaven fan. I kind of find their music a little dull. This actually has riff changes and more dynamics. And coming back to this one, I hadn't listened to this one in years. In fact, I probably hadn't listened to this one since it came out. And this came out in 2015. But I really enjoyed coming back to this one. There are lots of cool elements blended in here. Colony, the second track in here, has a lot of post-hardcore elements. The screams sound more desperate and pleading rather than, you know, harsh and terrifying like you would expect from most black metal projects. The song Yearn is decidedly more slow. There's a really cool atmospheric buildup and the riffs on it are particularly heavy. They kind of abandon a lot of the droning tremolos and kind of get down to some just flat out hefty riffs. And honestly, it kind of sounds a little bit like Gojira. Like it kind of has that like syncopated stomp to it and like a really nice groove. The same can be said for the title track too. Like it starts off very groove laden, but then breaks into like kind of like crust punk D beats. There's some blasts in there. Like it gets really heavy, but honestly, like probably the darkest song on here, kind of a weird title for it too, is Glory. Glory is probably the only song in here where it feels outright sinister. Like you get that claustrophobic, the shadows are closing in on me sort of vibe to it. And the rest of this, Again, it's like very bright and 
kind of lush and atmospheric, like you feel like you can kind of like float on the music. This one kind of just drags you down into a pit of darkness and then things come out and attack you. Kind of a weird way to describe that, but it is accurate. But I'm generally not into very shoegazy stuff, but this is shoegazy, but it also has riffs. There's a good balance, there's a give and take. So you're not just getting lost in that drone of like tremolos and you know, just the big soundscape. Like there's moments where they break it down a little bit, drop out everything, you know, build up back into something completely different. I don't get a lot of that in Death Heaven, which is kind of why I knock them. Like it gets very static. This actually has like a lot of cool dynamics to it. And honestly, I want to check out some of their earlier albums because I've never really gone past this album. Again, this one's kind of been on the shelf collecting dust until I actually started listing out all these bands from the area and was like, oh wow, this band's from New Hampshire. I thought they were Norwegian just because that name screams I'm from Norway. But yeah, this is really solid if you're into bands like Harakiri from the Sky and I mean by extension Asteroid too because that band is still roughly attached to this band and maybe like a little bit of Gojira too. Either way, check this one out. This is a really solid album and again, I definitely want to check out more of their stuff. Trap Them, Crown Feral. This is the fifth and final album from the Salem grindcore, hardcore, crust punk, uh, maybe even a little bit of death metal in their act. So this one, while they did originate in New Hampshire, they do have members from Boston and Seattle, and the band did move to the Boston area, I believe, not long after they formed. I kind of just chose with sticking with uh, New Hampshire in this one just because I'd already done Massachusetts. And honestly, I was looking for an excuse to talk about this band because this band flat out rules. I love their entire discography. This is just vicious as hell. And I chose to go with this one because while it is their swan song, I think it might be their best album. Again, I like all their stuff. I've been into them since their Seance Prime EP and pretty much anything that dropped afterwards, I was grabbing. This band is like the perfect blend of Converge and Entombed. This has all the hardcore and metalcore ferocity, lots of D beats and just vicious hardcore screams and snarling riffs, but it also has a wonderfully sizzly, ugly HM2 guitar tone. And yeah, I'm pretty much like in heaven with this band because it just, you know, exemplifies two things I love in vicious music, like just nasty metallic hardcore and HM2 death metal. And this album blends it just about perfectly. You have lots of moments where it builds up in haunting atmosphere, lots of distant melodies. The opening track, Kindred Dirt, while it is more of an intro track, is actually musical and it builds into this sinister move with these desperate shouts and then right into Hellion Airs. And it's just D beats, killer turnovers, the drum work in here is absolutely fantastic, and just outright explosive songs. These songs are out to destroy eardrums and property, but they're also really catchy as well. Songs like Revival Spines and Mal Engines Here Where They Should Be, those songs have like great hooky riffs on them. Prodigala has this really cool riffy tag that has this like fun little harmonized crawl at the end of it. DB driven as hell. I love the drum work in here. Very similar to Ben Kohler of Converge. There's all sorts of like blasty accents where they're not necessarily kind of hanging on the blast beat as a rhythm, but more or less as a fill or like a transition into another part. The breakdowns are hefty. They're mean spirited. The riffs go from like hardcore to thrash to death metal. There's a lot of comparisons I could make to a band like Black Breath as well too. Twitching in the Auras starts off the song with big war drums. Like the production here sounds fantastic and there's a damn good reason why. It's Kurt Balu from Converge doing it. And yeah, we just gushed about him in the last High on Fire album and we'll probably gush about him in the next thing he does because that dude just does amazing work. and especially on the drums. The drums in his mixes always sound huge. And yeah, they sound absolutely great. There's a good punch to the bass drum. But the thing that I love about this album in particular, even in comparison to their other albums, is this one is probably their most dynamic and arguably their most successful. But trust me, that doesn't mean you're gonna get like sing-songy choruses or you know anything like that. This is vicious through and through, but it's way more catchy. A lot of the grind aspects, are kind of like, you know, pulled back a bit. Like there's a lot of like punky, snarly bits on here, of course, and D beats, but it doesn't come across as 
like as grind core driven as some of their earlier stuff. And this one is definitely more riff driven too. It's not as much about the squawky alarm clock riffs or dissonant atmosphere. This one is out to cave in heads with just riffy aggression. I flat out love this band in general and I miss them because they broke up not too long after this album. And I was so stoked when this one came out. I was like, yeah, maybe I'll finally get a seam on tour. And then yeah, no, we're done. And then they announced their breakup and I was pretty damn bummed, but uh, as far as recommending any of their albums, of course, this is probably the one I'll say, like, this is probably the easiest to get into, but go ahead and just jam all their stuff. All of Trap Them, I think, is awesome. Darker Handcraft, in particular, I think is quite a banger as well. Almost equal to this one, but they're kind of different albums. Either way, if you're looking for something that's, again, like, Converge and Entombed and Dismember and Black Breath, kind of all whirled up into one very caustic, violent sound, it's Trap Them. Jam them, they're awesome, and they are definitely still missed. Distrust. No good deed shall go unpunished. I don't know what city they're from in New Hampshire, but I know they're from New Hampshire, or at least were because this band has been broken up for a while, I believe. But this is kind of a hybrid of death metal, thrash metal, and hardcore. And I've had this album for years. This is a 2008 reissue of this album. It originally came out in 2000. And I have to say, I don't come back to it very often just because I don't like looking at this album cover. I have seen tons of disturbing album art everywhere, but for some odd reason, this one really just bugs me. And it's not so much the fact that there are severed limbs and a severed head sitting there right in front of me. It's the expression on her face. Like she's been really inconvenienced by this. Like some serial killer found some dead-eyed waitress in a waffle house and was like, you know what, I'm gonna hack off your limbs and your head. And she was like, you know what, fine. It's it's whatever, you know, can I have a smoke first? That expression is just horrible. It's like he asked her if he could get a ride to the airport after he hacked off her head. But the band itself has, again, quite a wild sound because it goes back and forth between all these styles. Like a lot of thrash metal riffs, like fast galloping rhythms and chuggy riffs. And then when they get down to like death metal, it's generally more groove laden. And this band definitely has an interesting sense of humor. Uh, the one track that I always came back to, and it wasn't just because of the title, I mean, the song's actually pretty good. It's got a really catchy tremolo hook on it. No government cheese for this cracker. That's a pretty hilarious song title. But while there's tons of death metal riffs and thrash metal riffs and speedy parts and like death metal tremolos, there's a lot of like hardcore groove. But the vocals definitely have like more of a hardcore vibe, even down in the cadences, like they kind of you know, syncopate to the giant chuggy riffs and it, that just kind of has like a hardcore vibe to it. And surprisingly, the songs are a little bit longer, but they also pack a lot of cool dynamics. And again, shifting from style to style. It can go from flat out 90s death metal to like a DRI crossover barn burner, like the song Bloodstorm Trilogy. And also they're pretty solid at all of them. Like the thrashier songs in here, like Don't Wait For Dawn and Threshold, Got solid riffs. Threshold's got this great galloping chug in it that's just catchier than hell. And again, there's like this sort of like punky sort of vibe to this entire album that kind of makes it a little bit loose and fun. And if that doesn't do it, then there's also some really interesting samples from movies like The Shining, uh, Frighteners, and Johnny Dangerously. They got the Joe Piscopo quote about, I fulfilled a lot of expectations for a lot of people about me. I became a real scumbag, or at least something to that effect. I don't remember it verbatim, but I remember that was a pretty funny quote. And I believe that's the one that kicks off no government cheese for this cracker. So yeah, they kind of cement that it's going to be silly right out of the gate. But the album and the songs overall are kind of fun and kind of clever. And like maybe like a little self-aware as to like how silly they are, but they still bring a lot of killer riffs. And honestly, like a lot of the song construction, I think is really solid. Like when they transition into like kind of a different style, they generally do it pretty smoothly. I think the drum works solid. Again, the riffs are catchy and that sort of ranting vocal style and a good chunk of this. I don't know, it's kind of fun. If you're a big fan of like, I guess death thrash in general, like in terms of comparing this to a band in general, like uh, it's kind of hard because it's such a mix of things. Like I definitely got like a lot of 90s death metal. Like there's 
like malevolent creation and maybe like a touch of deicide on here but again it kind of moves around a lot and there's definitely like a big crossover thrash vibe like dri on some of these tracks but it's all kind of homogenized in a really fun goofy clever way and yeah this album is fun despite you know me not wanting to look at this album cover ever again but yeah this is their only album i don't know if they ever reunited after they broke up uh but it's a pretty solid album overall so yeah just check this one out it's <laughs> it's a lot of fun. The Network, Bishop Kent Manning. This is the second and, I mean, final album from this New Hampshire-based hardcore slash grindcore act. I remember picking up their first one when it dropped because it was on Black Market Activities and it was big on that label at the time. And I really wasn't like the biggest fan of it, but I gave their second album a chance. And honestly, this one is so much better overall. But to be honest, I hadn't listened to this in like forever. This was another one that was collecting dust on my shelves. And again, when I was making out this list, I was like, oh wow, all right, we got a band from New Hampshire that I didn't know was from New Hampshire. But I'm glad I revisited this one because this thing is just flat out vicious. Violent, spastic, hardcore slash grindcore, very similar to bands like Full of Hell, Coalesque, Converge. Uh, I would even say like Norma Jean to a degree. Maybe even some like early cave in, like lots of just rapid fire like blast beats and quick transitions sharp angular squawky riffs vicious vocals but this one showcased a lot of dynamic that the first one didn't the first one is you know loud spastic angry you know everything that this one is but this one just does it better and does it with more hooks it's definitely a more memorable album overall these songs are more memorable just because there's just more to these songs that actually make them stand apart from one another instead of just being you know, one shit fit after the other. All these songs are pretty much packed with like just crazy dissonant riffs and crawling melodies and just pummeling breakdowns, but there's also more melody to it. And not like saying like it's like super catchy, but there's something on there that actually makes it memorable while still retaining just a dark, unsettling vibe. Kind of like the song Chorus Paint. There's like a really good hook to it, but it's still vicious and disgusting. The riffs are out to just break every bone in your body. But it also sort of plays off of the vocals sounding way more tortured and anguished than they do angry that time. I don't know if it was a dig at black metal or an attempt to kind of capture black metal atmosphere and a hardcore slash grindcore song, but either way, it kind of works. This also has a lot more control and restraint than the first one. Like there's moments in here where they definitely know how to just kind of settle into a groove and deliver a solid riff. The song uh, Paranoid Deserter, that song's flat out catchy and it's not trying to move a million miles an hour with like crazy turnovers in between the blasts. It's just laying on some solid riffs. There's even a flat out noise track near the end called You Fucking Fakes. Wow. But yeah, while this album is just like a serious bout of just rage and fits of anger, there's something actually memorable about it. And the bands that do that well, again, Coalesce, Converge, Full of Hell, they know how to like make these songs kind of stick with you other than, you know, just like the blunt force trauma that they've delivered at your head. They make them memorable. And this album, I think, is grossly underrated. Like coming back to this one, you know, after years of kind of forgetting I owned it. This was quite a listen. I think when I initially got it, maybe I didn't appreciate how spastic it was. Like the transitions on here are absolutely bonkers at times. They're razor sharp and kind of hard to pick up sometimes. Like you'll be trying to headbang along to a breakdown and then all of a sudden they flipped into some like weird jazzy pattern for a second. But yeah, uh, this is absolutely fantastic. If you're a giant fan of Converge, even uh, Dillinger Escape Plan, Definitely Coalesce. There's a lot of stuff in here that reminds me of Coalesce. I got into that band around the same time I got into Brutal Truth. But yeah, check this out. This is a really solid album. The first album's all right. This is definitely the one to check out. Sadly, this band's not around anymore. But, you know, at least you got the two albums to check out. Contagium, Impure Crushing Death Demo. This is the first demo from this Franklin-based death metal act. Now, this band does have a full length out right now uh, called Chronicles of Carnage. I didn't pick that one up. In fact, I totally forgot where I got this. I think I got it in like a, you know, a grab bag box that I got years ago. But uh, going back over it, this is just some absolutely savage death metal. Now, I'm going to lay off the production on this one for the most part because the production here is very raw, like very thin drums and guitars. It sounds like it was pretty much recorded in a garage around like a tape deck, maybe a little bit better than that, but it is very raw. But when it comes down to the music itself, this is just absolutely 
brutal, savage, old school death metal. The vocals are vicious, it's very high energy, it does have like a lot of just nasty, groovy pockets, but man, this thing's got some absolutely disgusting riffs. The opening riffs on Reanimated by Maggots and Subjected to Strangulation absolutely just kick off with furious fashion. Like they are just flat out 90s level disgusting death metal riffs, and it kind of walks a balance between like old school death metal with like touches of brutal death metal, and even some doomy flair here and there. So it's not just like kind of like a meat and potatoes death metal style, like there's definitely some other elements that kind of get woven in their sound. The last track, Holocaustic Overdose, definitely has some more doomy overtones, like there's some more sinister, sludgy, slow moving riffs. There's solid riffy breakdowns all over this. It is a really short album, like this is, I don't think, even 20 minutes long. Most of the songs are very short and compact, but they're all vicious and punchy. I kind of want to actually get the full length after going back and listening to this just to hear them, you know, produced a little bit better because this band's just got like a solid sound overall. Like it kind of checks off a lot of different boxes I like in death metal. And I like the fact that it is sort of a blend of brutal death metal, old school death metal, and just a hint of death doom. I'd say if you're a big fan of like, I guess like early immolation, maybe heat eternal, a little bit of like Dying Fetus, I don't know, it's kind of like a hodgepodge blend of death metal. It's, you know, like there's a lot of different bands that this band sounds like, and admittedly it is kind of hard to like center in on exactly what they sound like with the rougher production here, but if you can get past the rougher production, definitely check this out. And eventually I am gonna check out the full length EP, I might even order it and cover it in a collection update and let you guys know what I think about that. But overall for a very rough demo, this is some pretty solid death metal, so check it out. Since the Flood, Valor and Vengeance. This is the debut album from this metallic hardcore act that hails out of some part of New Hampshire, at least New Hampshire at the time. I got into this band with this album. I believe it initially came out in 2005, but it was reissued after that. This, I believe, is the original version on Ironclad Recordings, which is Trevor Phipps from Unearth. And this is just straight up old school metallic hardcore, very much in line with bands like Earth Crisis, Early Hate Breed. It's really not big on the melody, it's more about the brutality. Like this is about like teenage angst, standing up for yourself, maybe getting into a couple of fights, and about riffs and breakdowns. And this just kind of boils metallic hardcore down to its most primal elements. Lots of groove, lots of breakdowns, chuggy syncopated riffs. You get some fast paced D beat rippers on songs like These Scars, 24K, The Only Way. The Only Way actually has blast beats on it for a little bit, but the riffs themselves are definitely more like just straight up hardcore, fiercely down picked. There are like some spots of melody where you can kind of hear like a little bit of that mellow death sound kind of creeping in, but it never really kind of loses that sort of like, you know, tough guy from the streets sort of vibe. Like it never goes, well, full bore towards like Unearth, which Unearth really worked a great balance between like just violent hardcore slash metallic hardcore energy and loving stuff like Iron Maiden and In Flames and incorporating in the sound. This stays pretty much firmly in that, you know, hate breed Earth Crisis realm. A lot of this is what I would call like just brass knuckle riffing. Even Up in Arms, that song has what I would call a slam riff in it. But again, like these little bits of like thrash metal and notes of melody kind of pop through to kind of like freshen up the songs a little bit and kind of give them, well, more than just the one dimension that you know, I would say like a good chunk of this has. Not saying that's a bad dimension though, like it's a fun dimension. I kind of grew up on this stuff. Like I love old school sounding like Victory Records hardcore stuff and this definitely has echoes of that. The vocals are all harsh. There's no singing on here. This is all just yelling and screaming and just violent as hell. There's good solid like metal grooves on here too. Like every now and then you get like a more metallic like double time groove. But for the most part, it is just syncopated chugs and just outright heaviness. But again, like some fun ways to transition. Breakdown lead-ins, I always look for those like how they kind of ramp it up because generally isolating a riff or a beat or a bass line or a vocal hook before the breakdown absolutely hits. That's always like kind of a big moment in a metallic hardcore album or just a hardcore album in general. That's always the part in the song where if the club owner is paying attention, he's looking around to see like, all right, which one of these meatheads is gonna completely throttle my bar. Now this man actually ended up getting signed to Metal Blade Records not too long after this one. They put out an album called No Compromise, which I thought was 
okay, like, by that point, when that album came out, which I believe was in 2006, their sound had already kind of sounded a bit dated. A lot of the metalcore bands that were coming out definitely embraced a lot more melody, you know, clean vocals and such. And even though, like, a band like Unearth really didn't do a lot of clean vocals at all, there was a lot more flair to the guitar play and the, the overall songwriting where this band kind of stuck to that old school gear and at that point it was kind of you know a bit of a dated sound so they ended up breaking up in 2008 and that has essentially been it for this band which sucks because honestly now with metallic hardcore kind of coming back the way it is this band would kind of fit right in with a lot of the stuff that's coming out right now but as it stands i totally recommend this album this is a straight up metallic hardcore banger it's just vicious and straightforward and again me being like a big fan of that early victory record sound like there's a lot of echoes of that on here if you love again earth crisis uh maybe a little bit of blood for blood definitely some early hate breed on here maybe in cold blood stuff like that definitely check this out this is a really solid album and finally we have Come to Grief, When the World Dies. This is the debut album from this New Hampshire-based uh, doom sludge metal act. And, well, all right, I say debut, but I don't know. It feels like it's kind of a continuation or a reformation, but there might be more to it. Because this band used to be Grief, which was an awesome sludge slash doom band from Massachusetts. But that band ended up folding, and then this band essentially kind of rose from the ashes. And, I mean, even down to the logo and the font, it's very similar, but it's not the same name. So, I, you know, I kind of wonder if there's, like, legal reasons there or if they just chose this as, like, a new jumping-off point for a new era of the band. It does feature two ex-members of Grief, and it is named after Grief's awesome debut album, which I own. So, I don't know, part of me thinks it's a continuation. And, well, I mean, it kind of is. Like, when you listen to this... It sounds a lot like grief. For the most part, it is slow, miserable, and heavy as fuck. The guitar tone in here is absolutely massive. It's sizzly and thick and just, you know, kind of just, well, sludgier than hell. The riffs themselves just sort of ooze misery, and if that's not enough, the shrieked vocals on top of them will give you, like, echoes of I Hate God, albeit without, like, the jazzy drum patterns. Like, this is... Very straightforward and groovy, occasionally picking up the pace ever so slightly, but for the most part, all of these songs, all of the riffs in here are just here to drag you down to hell. This album, and you know, by extension Grief too, is just as sludgy, menacing, and unsettling as anything that crawled out of a Louisiana swamp in terms of like you know, the NOLA scene or just the Louisiana sludge metal scene in general. It's very meat and taters, but it is very effective in its delivery. Like, Scum Like You, that song literally drags you to hell. Like, that descending melody is just so ominous and oppressive and dark. If there was one song on this album that I would say matches the vibe of this album cover, it is definitely that one. But I also have to say Devastation of Souls. While that one is, again, slow, menacing, sludgy, there's a really cool section in the bridge where it kind of gets in this like Sabbathy swing groove. Like it's a little bit more upbeat. It sounds like something you would hear on the bridge of like a crowbar song or a down song. Like, you know, it's not necessarily like uplifting because nothing about this band is uplifting, but it is something to break up the soul crushing nature of this album. The title track actually utilizes a little bit more atmosphere to lead in the song. Like it's kind of creepy and unsettling before the bass line comes in and then the giant heavy droning riffs but man nothing is as slow and as miserable as bludgeon the soul slash returning to the void that is the slowest grimiest filthiest song on here i would say it's like they weren't impressed enough with the song scum like he was like no we can go even grimier and yeah that song is just bleak it is defeated and yeah that album is flat out awesome this was close to being on my year end list for 2022 but you know, 2022 was another year that was absolutely loaded with killer releases. I love this entire album. It feels more like New Orleans sludge than anything else, but I like that vibe, clearly. I went over that state and that was a lot of fun to go over. But I like the fact that even New England's got some absolutely awesome sludge in their ranks. This is an absolutely killer album if you have not checked it out. And by extension, go check out Grief. The debut album from Grief, which this album is named after, might even rival how just absolutely crushing this one is. You can't go wrong with either though. Check this out. Absolutely killer album. 
And that does it for New Hampshire. And I'm not sure which one I'm gonna do next. I don't know if I'm gonna move out west, go south, maybe go a little bit north. I don't know, uh, plenty of options out there. I haven't got down to the states where I'm gonna have to like compile a bunch of states together in order to have something to talk about because Again, some of these states really don't have a lot of metal bands, but I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Either way, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you are new to the channel, subscribe because we do stuff like this all the time. We are also on Patreon. If you'd like to help us out there, there's a link down below to thrallsmetal.com. Our Patreon link is there. It is also on our channel up in the banner in the bottom right hand corner. But if you're looking for Thrall's Metal stuff, you have to go to thrallsmetal.com. We have t-shirts, both old and new. The old ones are discounted, provided we have your size. And we even have hats too. So if you're looking for any of that stuff, click the link down below. And of course, thank you guys so much for liking, commenting, sharing, all that stuff. It means the world to us. It is amazing seeing this channel grow. Again, this exceeded any of my expectations years ago. And it continues to be a ton of fun. Looking forward to doing a ton more reviews. Again, the next discography ranking is Meshuggah. It has been tabled for a little bit because we got MDF coming up. And then after that, we're going to really kind of focus on that one and get that together and then select some new bands, which should be a lot of fun. And of course, tons of the usual. I don't know. I might even start some other threads or um, different playlists or something like that. Who knows? I mean, it's metal. It's wide open. There's lots to talk about, and I'm glad you're enjoying it so far. So one more big thank you because you guys are awesome and we... We'll catch you later.